We made it long last. Yeah. Thanks very much. Uh, first and foremost, I don't really know what I'm going to talk about, but uh, anyway, God, I thanks for the invitation and I think it's about motivation. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I had to be motivated at the uh, about 100 mile an hour down the road there, so <laughs> when you're full of red diesel, sometimes that's difficult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I made it anyhow, it was that a thing about me, but uh, Rosanna, there's Rosanna, I didn't see Rosanna there. <laughs> uh, listen, uh, I won't keep you terribly long, that, that build up was probably good enough, but uh, I think there's several ways of motivating either yourself or other people and that can be done by other people motivating you or it can be done by you motivating yourself. That's the way I have to do, to be honest, all my life. Uh, I didn't have the best of starts in life because I lost my father when I was two years of age. He died at 26 uh, of a brain hemorrhage, uh, which left my mother to try and bring us up to the best of our ability. It was tough. I had a bigger brother and uh, he's a lot bigger now, right enough. I had a bigger brother and uh, it was a struggle. She had two jobs to try and keep us going and, and uh, she worked as a farm labourer and she also cleaned houses in the evenings and that was just to pay the bills and, and put a loaf of bread on the table. So I think when you get, and then obviously I was also uh, a Protestant called Lane. <laughs> that took me down many an avenue I should never go down to be honest. Uh, but anyhow, I've been called a Baldy Fenian bee and a Baldy Orange bee, so I've been there and it actually happened on the one game if you believe. Uh, and that's gospel truth, that's absolutely true. But uh, I think that those when you have a start like that in life, uh, you know, you can either feel sorry for yourself or you can pick up the courage and, and maybe have a point to prove and, and that's exactly how I felt. I I just felt I had a point to prove. We didn't have a lot. I realised fairly early on I was decent at football. You need a bit of ability in life I think but you need a bit of luck as well and, and I was blessed with both. I had a bit of ability to play football and I also uh, was lucky. And uh, I remember getting picked to play for Northern Ireland school boys and had no boots. I always borrowed boots from other people because my mum couldn't buy me a pair and Three aunts and three uncles all gave ten bob each back in the day. You remember those days, or something. Back in the day, <laughs> when it was ten bob and not uh, not uh, what it is nowadays. But they, they gathered together three pounds. They said, "You're not going." We were playing against England at uh, at Main Road, Manchester, and they said, "You'll you'll not be going there in a pair of borrowed boots. We'll we'll get you a pair of boots." And they gathered up three pounds and sent me to Bishops and Coleraine, and the boots came to two pound fifty. Uh, I got the boots and I had 10 bob left, 50p nowadays, and they said you can keep that as spending money. I don't think I'd ever saw a 10 bob note in my life, but I set sail to Manchester and with my accent, uh, you don't say a big lot when you're in among Belfast people. They think I'm Polish up there for the first 20 minutes. <laughs> uh, I arrived in Manchester not having spoke to anybody and they told us all to go to bed before uh, 9 o'clock, be in bed. And, and lights out at nine o'clock. We were in a dormitory in a school. They put us. There were no hotels in those days. They put us in a dormitory. And so I did as I was told. As a company boy, you always sort of did as you were told. And I got into bed at nine o'clock and rolled my trousers up with my ten bob. And I, and I remember lying in bed thinking, what will I do with ten bob? I felt really, really rich. And I thought, I'll buy my mum an ornament because ornaments were the whole goal in those days. And I thought, I'll buy her an ornament because she's had a tough life, and that's what I spent my ten bob on. And but the rest of the lads were sliding up and down the floor and having a bit of fun. But I got up in the morning and brushed my teeth and combed my hair, which I have no say to love telling this story because I had hair then. And uh, I headed into the breakfast room along with the rest of the players and I remember putting my hand in my pocket and my ten ball was gone. Uh, some of my so-called teammates had nicked my ten ball when I was sleeping. So the ten ball that I'd only in my possession for about 24 hours was gone. And I spent the rest of the four days in Manchester with nothing. And when the team went down the street, went into a shop for a few sweets and things, I stood out in the footpath. Uh, I never even told the manager, he probably wouldn't have understood me anyhow, but I, I never <laughs> told him what had happened. And uh, I spent the four days, we get chin 4 1 as well, so it wasn't a great trip to Manchester, but it taught me a lesson as well that, you know, if you don't have a big lot and you have any money at all, I future I always stuck to the roof of my mouth with chewing gum after that, <laughs> just to be at the safe side if I went to sleep. But it was a tough, tough time, and I always felt you had two choices, and you could either 
lie down because I didn't have a father to, to motivate me, I didn't have a father to guide me, I had a bloody hard working mother who did everything that she possibly could for us to bring us up properly and uh, so you've got to then find that inner strength to motivate yourself. Uh, didn't play much football for the next five years because I got an offer to serve my time as a, a plumbing and heating engineer and I took that and I never kicked the ball again until I was I think 20 when I was offered a chance to go to Crusaders. I was a bit reluctant in Belfast because I had a bad experience obviously but I went. It was a good decision. I was lucky. I motivated myself to go uh, and then I was lucky as well that they had built a really good team and they were only won the league title for the first time ever and I was part of that when we played one reserve team game and went straight into the first team and again that was a bit of luck. But I felt all the time I had to keep mo motivating myself because the manager we had then wouldn't have been the best man, manager or motivator, but he was a lovely man and he left that to yourself and sometimes if you needed motivation or you were looking for guidance, you just had to basically do it yourself. So I did. Uh, I was lucky there that I played and won the league and we won the Carlsberg Cup as well and then I got transferred to Drogheda where they took me to chapel the first day I arrived. They thought I was a Catholic. And they took me and they showed me Oliver Plunkett's head. I came from a very staunch unionist family and, and they were all Rangers and, and, and Lumphy supporters and I thought, what the hell, because this chapel kept getting bigger and bigger and they were taking me down the main street like, a, like an old heifer they bought at the market and reduced me to all the shopkeepers and then this chapel keeps getting bigger and bigger and it was, I realised as they opened the doors, oh, Jesus, they think I'm a Catholic. And so they did, they took me and I said, what's this about? They said, we want to show you Oliver Plunkett's head, it's on here in a glass case. And, they took turns of taking me round over. I knew over quite well by the time I came out again. <laughs> <laughs> I was dizzy up the bargain. And then I saw the paparazzi outside the door of the chapel with the cameras, you know, and I thought, geez, if they take a picture of me coming out of here, I'll get hung from the near stream and go back to Balamone because I live just on the periphery. That's the edge or something. The periphery of the Glebe side of the And uh, so, uh, anyhow, I got out the side door and I, I rode me up for about maybe... Another week, uh, I think we won the, the first game and then during the second week and there were several other Catholics in the van and that was in, obviously in the 70s when the troubles were at their height. And again, you had to keep motivating yourself. There was nobody there to guide me home other than my mum who didn't know a big lot about football. But we're going down the second week, I'll never forget the minibus and there's six of us in it and they're all Danny Trainer from our town and Jordi Halloran from the Falls Road and Martin Donnelly from the Falls Road and they course all the time think I'm a Catholic as well so and they're singing every rebel song there is going down to the bus and they're singing and singing all these men behind the wire Billy Reed, Four Green Fields, every rebel and I'm up in the middle giving a Dixie. <laughs> and I swear to God I didn't know the words and I'm thumping on the side of the band so they, so they don't realise they don't know the words and I'm singing away. In fact the second week I was leading the singing good <laughs> And I thought, how the hell can I keep this going for much longer? You know, I'm riding my luck here. And then the third week we were going down, and I remember I was freezing in the bus, and I said to the driver, we mousy Brady, mousy, turn the heating on, I'm, I'm freezing. And big Danny Trainer, God rest him, was sitting beside me from our down, and Danny says, they can't turn the heating on, Bex, the butter will melt. And I thought, jeez, I know I speak a bit broad, you know, that's how bad money acts. He must not have understood me. And Jackie Fuller and all was just to say to me, Liam, speak slowly and concisely. <laughs> he was the man who said, they think you're Polish up here. <laughs> so I said, I'll speak slowly, that's fine. I'll speak slowly and concisely. So I spoke slowly and I said, Mousy, could you turn the heating on please, I'm freezing. And uh, Big Danny chirped up again and the old boss was so noisy, Mousy couldn't hear me. And Danny says, no, no, we heard you the first time, did you not know? The butter on that. And I says, what butter? He says, look below the seats. And I swear I looked underneath the seats. and. Every seat was packed to the neck with Tremona butter. They were fucking smuggling butter over the border. <laughs> it was four times more expensive in the south. And I'm thinking, I'm only here three weeks. I've been to chapel. I know every rebel song there is back to front. And now I'm smuggling bloody butter. <laughs> my man would have worn my ears. I had to know the half of it. But I, my cover got blown in the fourth week anyhow because Mousy walked into the dressing room and I was hanging up. Uh, Remember we all had the sheepskin coats back then with the old fur collar, you were, if you were a footballer you had the, a mind was fake. I realised that and I lifted Jackie Forders one day by mistake in the crusader's dress room and it nearly hit the floor for the four times heavier than mine, even though the shade at Knox Corner assured me mine was the real big boy. But anyhow, uh, I 
was hanging up my fake sheepskin coat in the corner of the dressing room and Moisey walked in and he says, by the way lads, your man, and this is his exact words, your man in the corner is a Jaffa. <laughs> and that was how he introduced me to the rest of the dressing room and you would have heard a pin, I think I had a brown hemorrhage there and then. Because <laughs> they realised then I was a prod. But anyhow, they treated me well, and, and, and this is true, when we were coming back to the north sometimes, they used to start singing, you know, will we sing it for them? No, we'll not sing it. I go on, we'll sing it. No, we'll not. And they would have sang the sash as we come over the border, then back to the north. And I knew they didn't know the words, because they were all up thumping the same <laughs> And I knew they were as bad as I was. But again, that was, they were tough times, the troubles were bad at the time, but... I had a choice of either staying at Crusaders and earning seven pound a week or going to Drogheda and getting forty pound a week. They were a full time professional outfit, so I had no choice in the matter. And those were things that I found that I had to motivate myself uh, to go ahead and take the risks. And my mum was really scared of going over back and forward over the border because they were shooting people just for no other reason than if you were green or uh, or red, white, and blue. They just they, they, and I had a really good friend Jimmy Hasty who could shot. A good footballer and he got shot in the back just because he was in the wrong place at the wrong time and, and it was a difficult time but again you had real no, I had no real choice because if I wanted to survive in life I had to motivate myself and, and there was an awful lot of that you know there's a lot of decision making that perhaps uh, other people that have two parents can can go home and sit down with them and have a chat with them and they'll tell them maybe you know they'll guide them and, and they'll give the guidance that people look for but I think when you just have the one parent and it's a mum uh, who's not maybe that sports orientated then an awful lot of that's left up to yourself then so your decision making can sometimes be wrong and it can sometimes be right but I think if you, I never was a great fan of education either I just had a secondary education sometimes I regret that in the BBC now because if there's a phone in and some of the big words he use I have to pass it on to Joel Tiger or Steve Watson or somebody who is well educated but I don't really mind, to be honest, I think you, you make your own bed and you lie on it, but an awful lot of that is down. If you don't have a motivator, you know, we have a question in sport, uh, you know, who motivates the motivator? And, and it's a true saying, because if the motivator's down or feeling down, who do you turn to, you know, who motivates the motivator? But I think an awful lot of that comes from within. So my message would be, in particular, if I'm speaking at any youth uh, tournaments or any youth uh, launches of any type, I always say, you know, have a dream and, uh, and fix your, your, your beliefs and, and have your focus and have your self-belief. Because if you don't believe in yourself, other people's going to struggle to believe in you. You've got to have self-belief, you've got to have focus. But you can have a dream and, and once you get that dream, the 50 pound must be up, he's only tell me it's time to move on. So, uh, if you have that dream, follow that dream. Uh, and, and and you'll probably get there if you have that self-belief that's essential in life. And, and I was also involved in the motorbikes, as some of the people will know, and with the Dunlop family. And, you know, that's, that's a working-class, humble, modest family who have been through beat the hell and back. Uh, and if you ever needed motivation, you should spend a bit of time just in the company of one of them because I think it was them you know, that invented the word motivation because sometimes they weren't born with a silver spoon in their mouth. They had to uh, scrimp and make do and let some bills go unpaid to maybe put a tire on a motorbike. But uh, motivation is something that I think in my case came from within. The Dunlops would have been the same. And if you apply yourself properly, I think it will work. And if you don't, uh, you might be struggling. So I would just Wish everybody a happy and healthy summer. Isn't the weather great out there? Uh, factor 50 job, all right. Uh, have a, a happy and healthy summer, and, and thanks for having me tonight. I hope the rest of the night goes well. Thank you very much.